Hey, welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome. -na 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 oh, it's so good to be here today. Montgomery Fox coming in on Blown Speakers episode. Did we say 29? 29. Montgomery Fox here from Washington, D.C. saying hello. And I'm here with the great, of course, Blown Speaker himself, David Henningman. Hmm. Hello, everybody. Coming in, coming in from Yokohama. Yeah. What's Mother's happening? Mother's Day weekend, right? Saturday morning, right now. Right on. Yeah. Um, hmm. Shout out to the mothers because this is a uh, this is a male centric uh, episode. That's for sure. So shout out to the mothers today. We're celebrating the mothers here uh, as well. We're trying to decide which day to get it together with. Uh, Saturday, hmm. Sunday, we got rain around, so we're trying to deal with the rain and the COVID and the who's vaccinated and where we're going to be and barbecue. But it's great. Good problems. So, yeah. Don't you feel the pressure as the father on the Mother's Day? Um, not, not especially. I think she'll, ah, I think she'll just tell me exactly what she wants. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm not doing. No breakfast in bed. I got, I mean, I just pay attention to things everyone's the everyone's boohooing breakfast in bed it's gross so oh. we're, we're gonna we're gonna plate it down here and say come on down mom we huh. do coffee coffee and a flower hmm. sounds That's nice the plan speaking of gracious attitudes i i uh i i made it through another year and celebrated a birthday this week yeah happy b-day 49 yeah. thank oh. you or is your age a secret well, come on, man. You know, you don't, I, you know, I color this. I color this <laughs> to maintain my prestige. I have to gain respect. My boyish face gets no respect to my students. So I have to, I get the, I get the reverse uh, coloring. So this is the yeah, nice one. Look, check this out. The daughter made this card for me. Look at that old photo. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. So Touching how old, message. How old was she there? Here, that's uh, I think three and a half or four, something around there. Yeah, cute age. <clears throat> the best, mm -hmm. the best. Those were the years. <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs up on that decade. <laughs> I guess I have to wait till this one's over before the <laughs> before the votes are in. But I don't know. This decade's looking blah. so anyway. On to better and brighter things. I'm so excited uh, about this episode. You, you ain't kidding me, uh, folks. Fans of the blues, fans of American music, fans of uh, the greatest, uh, probably, you know, creative cultural output that North America's ever made. Um, and we're talking about the blues and jazz music. And it's celebrated here through the vehicle of the Blues Brothers. Briefcase full of blues, man. All right. Let's let's get into it. Yep, that's the one. Hmm. That is the one. That is the one. So um so yeah, I uh I mean, I, I got to admit David Henningman, when you first uh dragged me into this 20 some episodes ago, um and you thought, "Hey, what album you want to talk about?" This is like top 3 5 albums came to my mind just not for a number of reasons it needs to be it needs to be thought of and talked about in a uh, in a higher literary format like this right, right. <laughs> uh not in the, in the popcorn aisles of john landau's meatball you know lampoon this is some <laughs> critical musicality going down here and i have just such a personal relationship with it so th i think those two reasons exemplify why i i, I felt it important um, this hits the Montgomery Fox. We're talking the making of Montgomery Fox here. If if you if we can be blunt, it's my creation story, actually. Mm. Well, uh, that's that's what I figured, right? That's why I mean I figured, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm I'm looking forward to the stories. So yeah, um, lay them on us. <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> what do you know about this jazz? I mean, I, I mean, because I probably brought this album to Dayton, and was I playing it in Dayton? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't remember that specifically. I remember I a lot of... We were snobs to the blues, man. A lot of people 
I, I, I feel like a lot of people except had Phil. Blues except brother, Phil. except Phil. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I don't remember us listening to a lot of blues together at that time, right? Yeah. Um, I had a few albums I would sneak in for sure. For some reason, this was one of them. And I think it's because, and this is, might be something we get to, um, you know, that the Blues Brothers are, uh, are birthed out of a comedy shtick. You know, you know, and so as soon as you start from that, it's like, hey, what are we supposed to do with this? Is this funny or not? It's John Belushi, this tragic satire hero uh, who's in the end tragic. And am I supposed to enjoy this? Laugh at it? Um, you know, so anyway, yeah, I, I get it. And I think that's why I might not have pushed it, you know, and I think mm. now I've certainly come around and everybody knew it then and i knew it when i was a kid listening to this that this is solid shit and but just when you're in when you're in college you're not really pushing it phil like a good guy he is we'd be hard on stevie ray vaughn we'd be listening to a lot of albert king i put on an albert king song all the time at late night sometimes uh so i so i do remember those kind of uh, blues times but this is different of course right one of one of us had that Robert Johnson box set. True. I remember that. That's true, yeah. Chris. I think Chris like might have yeah. pushed that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, we were already loving this. Like this is the flavor of also the other music that we loved. Like Protex Blue would play some old '60s uh, tunes. Um, you know, we would jam some Motown tunes, and that's the same kind of flavor of this of these songs. All these songs are from the '50s and the '60s, uh, and then some of them, you know, written in the '70s. But uh, but it's from that same school. So anyway, we well, were no and, uh, and we were way into class in classic rock at the time. So I mean, listening to yeah. the Stones and stuff. So I mean, that's of course related to the blues. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, later. I, I mean, I saw B.B. King perform. I saw Buddy Guy perform. Um, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a blues fan. I'm not an authority, but, oh, there was this guy in Cleveland, Robert Lockwood Jr., who was um, tr uh, trained by uh, Robert Johnson, taught him how to play guitar. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we used to kind of regularly well. go see him play. I, I've um, seen him live. I've seen him live also. I've used his clips in the classroom to talk about him i mean nice. this is real stuff so we're going to talk about the history of the blues later kids because mm. this really is important stuff and i do believe that this is when you know uh i don't know who said this you can tell me uh you're the literature man um you know imitation is the most profound form of flattery something like that right oh i think my mother said that <laughs> <laughs> that's right um on Mother's Day, probably. And yeah. uh, when you all dressed up like her. That was a good year. That was a funny <laughs> year. That was hilarious. So so here we are looking at the band. And so we're gonna we're gonna go through it this nice and easy because there's so many layers to go to. But I'm sorry, we're not gonna we're not gonna uh, whack off John and Dan yet. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about the band because the Blues Brothers are a band and this ain't nothing without the band, you know. So, oh my God, look at this band. And so here you see the, this is the back of the, of the album. And, um, and so they're all there in their outfits, you know. I mean, they get some freedom, you know, just wear black and white. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, and, and you see the, uh, the uh, I suppose I can move this, right? So, you can, so we can see that, let's do it like that. Um, on the back of the jacket, of course, this is the story of the Blues Brothers, this fictional tale of Jake and Elwood, you know, and I think most people have seen the movie, they know the bits, you know, and, and, and this is the story, but, you know, the story is, of course, that this is a bit that grows out of Saturday Night Live, they, uh, they're opening for Steve Martin, I mean, this is, this is comedy apex, you know, <laughs> Steve Martin's doing uh, the, 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 the Hollywood Bowl and the Universal Amphitheater in LA and, uh, and they're like, hey, let's let's try it out. They had done the skits on Saturday Night Live a couple of times. We'll take a look at some of those. And then they're like, let's put a whole thing together. Why not? Because Belushi, we'll see, had done this before. So all these guys are kind of out there. It pulls them together. Let's do it. It's incredible. So um, anyway, so this is the fictional story about how they're born, you know, basically like the movie. You know, John Landau gets a hold of that. So this is 78. When's the movie? Like 80, right? 
I, I want to say 80, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um and I do got to admit that the that the movie because it's such a well, you know, what is your opinion of the movie? I mean, it's such a farcical hoo-ha of a Ferris Bueller kind of, you know, <clears throat> wow, it's a crazy movie, of course. And I love it with all the cameos. But yeah. it does it does kind of take away, I think, from the raw beauty of what this is about, which is the music and the blues, right? Okay. Hmm. I mean, um, I mean, I kind of feel like I grew up on that movie. I think my brother and I watched it again and again. And I think a lot of people, like from our generation, when you were a kid, I mean, um, just on your certain movies you'd watch over and over again on your VCR. Most, yeah. uh, right? Most people could know a lot of quotes from the Blues Brothers. I would say absolutely. Right? And that's good. I, I think, and, and I think in, in general, that's a good thing. But sometimes we get distracted by the, because <laughs> Belushi is quite a firecracker to pay attention to, <laughs> mm. you know, and the whole shtick is so funny. Um, but my God, these, these, these men, you know, and I'm sure they're all supported by wonderful mothers and women, but uh, these men are, uh, hats off to Mother's Day. These men are incredible. I mean, they just are. And I, and I know that, that down the road, as the Blues Brothers evolved, you know, that they're still a shtick and they still do their thing and, I, and they have rotating members. There's women in the band. I don't think they changed the name or anything. <laughs> they're the Blues Bros now, maybe. Um, so which names do you recognize, of course? Because uh, I, I, know, I know them all and I love them all. I heard this record. My father bought it when, when, when it came out. So I, I learned about these guys. Uh, their names just stick in my head, I think, from them. I mean, of course, we know Paul Schaefer. But um, yeah, Matt Guitar Murphy and Donald, <laughs> Donald Duck Dunn. I mean, those names totally stick in my head from the movie. And Blue, Blue Lou. Um, right. Yeah, because it's... It's at the end, right? When they do Jailhouse Rock and they kind of go through and they show everybody, right? And they yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's what's so great is they take. I mean, these guys stick together like a band. Like, like what what Belushi is able to do is like make this fictional thing happen, and then actually do it in real life. Because there's no question keeping these guys together for two, three years while he's managing addictions and party all night long attitudes, unbelievable, right? So were they together as like a touring band for that time? I mean, yeah. Okay, all right, yeah, I they, thought it was- Yeah, they right. did like 60, they, they did like, I was really surprised how many dates they did. Really? Uh, just over two years, they did two tours. They toured, um, um, uh, I think it's 79, and then they toured again in like 80 or something like that. Um, they played a few shows, like a few appearances. Uh, a lot of them are online. You can check them out. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad, uh, like the audio video. And then they went on tour. This is the tour. I see them. They went on tour after the album came out uh, to support the album. And then they went on tour again after the movie came out. So I'm ca I catch them um, in 1980 in July live. Oh. Get to that later. Yeah. After the movie, wow! So that I mean, that must have been really Blues Brothers. Look, I, I mean, I don't remember going to the theater to see the movie. I don't yeah. think my dad took me. I was only eight, nine. Um, but uh, uh, so I mean, going to see them live was probably more acceptable than going to the movie theater to see them. I don't know. I wasn't going to the movies yet. You know, at eight. No, but I guess I meant just the the Blues Brothers fever must have been at a right at a peak that year. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, assuming that movie was an instant success. I would, I would think. Um, right. Um, you know, one so, thing I, uh, I appreciate yeah. about that movie, you know, because watching it a lot as a kid, um, just entry level stuff. Like it was cool that you know, before I was ten, you know, I knew who James Brown was. I knew who Ray Charles was. You know, John Lee Hooker, Aretha Franklin. I mean, that's just. Um, you're you absolutely know, right. It's, that's not a given for a suburban white kid that he's going to know all that before he's 10, you know? So, I mean. Um, yeah. And yeah. at the absolute end of the day, that's exactly what and why I think John Belushi really, well, besides a vehicle for good times, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> which is probably Captain, 
co-captain is, you know, I don't know. I suggest you go out and buy as many blues albums as you can. You know, he wants to keep music alive. He loves that music and he knows those artists did not get their due. You know, so he, 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 I think he is of the many who pushed, you know, uh, the greatness of, of blues music and especially African-American made music that never got its due. Didn't earn the money as much as it could have, should have for all those reasons, man. So yeah, he done good. And because of that, cause this is 1980, you know, I mean, we're not, you know, Ray Charles isn't singing, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, they, we sing his songs now at the national anthem time, you know, God bless America and stuff. You know, I think it was slowly to accept those things. Anyway, it's mm -hmm. awesome. That was awesome. And well, and I'd like to talk more about that integration kind of stuff because the racial connectivity of this band and what these members did earlier, their connection to integrating America is true, is really true. As you just said. So, um, yeah, there's so many connections. I mean, the big thing, yeah, Paul Schaefer puts this band kind of together along with Belushi. Paul Schaefer's at Saturday Night Live with Belushi. Um, I, I, the two big members they get, of course, are Steve Cropper and, uh, and Mac Guitar Murphy. And, and they, they go deep. They play in 50s, 60s bands for a while. And w when we listen to some tracks today, oh, my God. Duck Dunn's bass is insane. It's it's just insane. It's so heavy. It's like John Atwistle, like funky, fast John Atwistle, unbelievable. So Steve Jordan, you heard of him before? Um, yeah, I mean, I think from from this, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know his okay. history. Guess who else uh, he drum he plays with? He's uh, he's Keith Richards' drummer. Oh, okay. The expensive winos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's on Keith's first solo album. I loved that album. I loved that album. So uh, yeah, he's great here. And then he he eventually leaves the Blues Brothers, and uh, and uh, and then it's uh, Willie Two Bit, uh, uh, Willie Two Bit Haynes, something like that, uh, joins the band later as drummer. Okay. Blue Blue Lou Marini is hilarious, All right. and and he's up front here in the long hair. Yeah, he's yeah. the best. So he's the long time. He's in the Saturday Night Live band. Um, Alan Rubin, Mr. Fabulous, he's he's out on a lot of these guys. So, so yeah, the Colonel, the Cropper and Murphy were hanging out probably together, and Jordan they just found. Lou Marini's at Saturday Night Live with uh, with Schaefer, and then the rest of the horns players are are just like scene guys that I think Schaefer finds, or they that they they know through Atlantic. Because look at this is Atlantic Records that <laughs> that signs these guys, and so. You know, but everybody's talking to everybody, you know, NBC and whatever, you know. But those three, the, the horn section there on the bottom, the the last three guys are uh, big, big, you know, just jazz, uh, you know, rock, rock and jazz guys, especially uh, Tom Scott. He's uh, he's 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 the only one on this album like Columbia Records represent, you know, Columbia Records, uh, you know. He's the guy that's already got a deal, you know, they got to say permission from, I think. Huh. Tom Scott. But, um, yeah, so awesome. Tom, yeah. Tom Scott's funny because I, I, didn't, I don't know nothing about Tom Scott except for this album. I hear Belushi introduce him once and I'm listening to his solos and then I'm sitting with Bart at his bar in Brooklyn, you know, my boy Bart, and he owns the bar, uh, um, uh, sidecar it's at fifth and fifth fifth avenue and 15th street check it out it's awesome and, and i'm there and and sure enough who's a regular at bart's place but uh john coltrane's john coltrane's son robbie robbie right is his name i believe robbie sold robbie coltrane and he's sitting there at the bar talking to bart and i'm like oh my god there he is hanging out and all of a sudden i hear someone say tom scott and, and I hear Coltrane and the guy next to Coltrane's talking about Tom Scott. And I'm like, you guys talking Tom Scott from the LA Express? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then Coltrane's like, yeah, Tom Scott from the LA Express. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Good. Uh, good tenor alto, man. So good. He's got that LA. He's doing it. <laughs> and I said something else stupid. 
because that's all I could say. I was like, please, let's not talk anymore about Tom Scott. Yeah. I was like, triple, triple scale. <laughs> <laughs> Because, of course, all I know is I don't, like, go find Tom Scott albums. I mean, I should have probably. <laughs> mm. But that was enough to have a, have a, a quick banter with, uh, with, with, with Coltrane. <laughs> he's, he's also a, a musician, I would assume. He is. Yeah. He is. He is. Uh, he is. So, uh, so, oh, my God. But, I mean, this, this, uh, this, this back of the album, having all the guys back here dressed like that is so awesome. But, um, um, you know, of all these guys, I mean, they've been through a lot. We'll talk about Cropper and Murphy some more. But, I mean, Matt Gu I mean, I'm sorry, Cropper and Dunn some more. But Matt Guitar Murphy has been around. He played, like, he's old. I believe he's still alive. Uh, am I right about that? It's 2020. I think he's still alive. He was born in the 40s. Woo, yeah, he's still alive. He comes up to Chicago and starts playing with Howlin' Wolf. I mean, he's he's incredible. And then he's playing with everybody. Um, are you looking it up now? To see if Mac I'm just writing it, writing it down to, to check. I think he is. I'll, I'll got... bet you money he is. He's born in the South. But, uh, oh, my God. He's he's just incredible. And his playing on with these guys is so fun and good. His scene, of course, is the probably the greatest musical scene with Aretha. He plays Aretha's husband. That's who I'm yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love oh that. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's incredible. Yeah. And, and Duck, uh, Duck Dunn is – no, it's not Duck Dunn. It's uh, Blue Lou is there too, right? And she's like, well, yeah, go yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. Blue Lou's my favorite. You know him from uh, Steve Martin's King Tut, right? Oh. no. I mean, I remember the King Tut bit, but I don't remember Blue he, Lou. All right. I got a freeze frame of that scene. I'll, okay. I'll show you later. So, uh, so let's see, let's move, let's move on kids. Um, so here we are, this album. Um, oh, so this is like about the album and the band. Oh, look who it is. Huh? Oh, they're under there, under in the, in the, in the buff. Yeah. Just to a uh, quick update on Matt Guitar Murphy. He did pass away, uh, three years ago. Um, but yeah, he had a long run. He was born in uh, 29, 1929 in Sunflower, Mississippi, and he passed away in 2018. So, um, mm -hmm. so very recently, very recently. Yes, rest now, now, that, now that you say that, I do remember when it happened. Um, now that you say that. Mm -hmm. I, I assume everyone's alive, um, and they are uh, in, in many ways, David. Well, but your point is clear that, yeah, he had... Uh, I mean, by the time, I mean, he was already 50 in 1980. So, I mean, he was, um, he had been around for a while. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, and as far as I know, uh, besides Belushi, uh, Belushi obviously passed away in 82, right? I think I want to say 82. Yeah. I think it was. About, yeah. Um, I remember so, that, man, when I was a kid. Else I mean, was, yeah, that was Oh, cute. absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess we'll get, I mean, and, and I mean, honestly, when, so when we look at this and these are uh, courtesy of Wikipedia, thank you very much, Wikipedia, for all your Pedia needs. Um, studio albums, uh, they did actually get in the studio, um, but never as Dan and uh, never as this band. They only did studio albums later when they would throw things together. Their live albums were the, the two live albums that they released, as you see here. 78 and 70 uh and in 80 those are the two live releases that they did now do you think um you being into these albums so young is that part of your your penchant for uh live albums do you think oh yeah yeah maybe i mean hearing that you know and that uh you know that'll i mean that that, that was my entry i mean i i felt like i was there hell yeah you know? <laughs> This was a formative album. This was one of those albums. And uh, and the more I, I learn and hear about stories of other people, I hear people talk about how, oh, we'd listen to that album all weekend long or something like that. They'd be talking about, oh, my Paul would play that album. We'd listen to that all album long. You know, just keep flipping it, you know? And mm. this was one of those albums. And there were a lot of albums that my parents would play. But we had the, one of those classic kind of um, piece of furniture stereos and on Friday and Saturday nights, you know, they would get out the cocktails and we may have people over or not. We'd be listening to records. And I remember that. So 
I mean, sure, sure. I think just being, you know, and the fact that we went and saw them live, it was such a prep and a great experience because the experience was the same. Listening to that record and then going to see them live was like dead same. It was it was electric, you know. So so sure and sure enough. So really, when we're looking at this, I mean, I think the remarkable information here is the fact that this thing went double platinum in the United States. Okay, <laughs> that's insane. Goes gold in the UK and then goes platinum in Canada. Hell yeah, Canada. <laughs> What's up with that? Because how many people are in Canada? You hear me? You know, and I mean, although what are they cooking the books in in Canada? They're they're saying that it's uh, platinum is only a hundred thousand, but double plat but platinum's a million in America anyway. It, We're just gonna shout out Canada here based on I'm population. Okay, maybe that it must be. I think it is right. Like you, you could you could have a double platinum album in uh, Iceland or something. <laughs> <laughs> big in Samoa, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, okay, I get it. All right, still a shout out to Canada because we'll get into why. Do you know why Canada loves the Blues Brothers? Oh well, I mean, Canada's such a. Um, they love comedy, right? I mean, a lot, and a lot of comedians from this generation were from Canada, and Toronto's right like a huge comedy town, right? Um, right on. So, possibly, right? But you okay? So Canada and the blues don't go together, right? Um, I, no. I mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say. I know it's a yeah. tough one. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't I think of them. I don't think of the Canadian blues. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean yeah, Neil Young can play some blues, right? Hey, there you go. So okay, there's the connections. Right, right, right. And you uh, know, it doesn't really, you know, I my yeah my connection to Canada would have been Ackroyd, right? Because he, like you said, the comedy of that but we're gonna find out my friends the number one blues band in canada is heavily featured on this album did you know that and we're yeah. talking about the down child blues band all right and and three tracks of this on this album are from the down child blues band so let's look down here 79 79 these are the big hits you know soul man obviously was the big hit that was on classic rock radio all the time right mm-hmm yeah, so it was Give Me Some Love, and I, I recall um, that was... I remember Rubber Biscuit, too, so... Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, so in a second, I mean, there's there's a rave review we're going to read from Rolling Stone magazine, but here are the tracks, uh, and, and this is what I want to get to, and we'll talk about all these influences, but, uh, but um, you know, Otis Redding, obviously doing the opening track there, and again, we want to emphasize that uh, the Steve, Steve, the Colonel Cropper, and Donald Dunn played in the in the backing band for Otis Redding and Aretha and all the Stax guys. So they were, you know, Cropper's the guitar on Aretha Franklin's "Respect," the guitar on "Sitting on the Dock of the Bay." You know, they and, were and, and Sam and Dave too. At and least Sam Cropper. And Dave. I'm not exactly. Yeah. So, but to see that, so all the, you know, all the songs that the Blues Brothers did were, were, were tunes that, um, that they, you know, were, weren't original. However, those guys were original members of those. They wrote those guitar parts, really. Uh, so anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, they did this Floyd Dixon song, Junior Wells. So you see the Down Child Blues Band there. And so they get one, two songs from the Down Child Blues Band. Um, and, uh, and we'll look at some pictures of them. So that's the most, they do in contemporary blues, which is interesting, right? Um, but when you hear those songs, they're amazing songs and they really fit in well. Uh, and that's really interesting that, uh, that uh, some white guys from Canada would fit into this, this canon of rich Chicago, Southern stacks, you know, blues and soul music, right? Yeah, 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 I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about the Down Child Blues Band. So yeah, yeah, yeah me neither, man. <laughs> and I didn't even look into them too much then. I really couldn't. I re I really didn't look into to, too much of them then, um, because I would just thought I'd eventually learn about them. Because I definitely eventually learned about it. almost everybody else came around, you know. Because I heard this album in 1980 when I'm like eight years old, and I'd slowly. Oh, there's so shredding, you know. Oh, there's these other people, and I would learn about them, you know. Mm. Go 
going on. But Down Child Blues Band, I never learned about until <laughs> looking this up, uh, you know, going a little deeper. It might have been a while ago, but uh, so funny. So, uh, um, so anyhow, check uh, this out. Okay. Got so this is, a, this is just an incredible review. So, I mean, I, again, I think most people are laughing at this kind of idea of the Blues Brothers because they've been on Saturday Night Live and they keep trying to do these things. Uh, but they released this album on Atlantic after a couple, you know, acts and then they decide to go real and put on a, a whole 45-minute set and this this review is pretty amazing. If you want to, you know, I'll be happy to read it. And um, would you like to read it, uh, David? It's pretty. Sure. It's pretty. It's a pretty great review. Sure. God only knows how Atlantic managed to lure these living legends into recording. But I'm here to tell you the straight poop. This band's got a street smart sound that's tighter than a toad's ass. I've heard rumors that. <laughs> John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd were intimately involved in this project, but believe me, the music on the Blues Brothers briefcase full of blues is no joke. Sweet, sweet slam. Rolling Stone, huh? Hmm. Excellent, excellent reading. You must be a teacher. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. That's great. And, uh, and um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's really phenomenal. And I think before we get into... And the fact that he he shouts out Aykroyd and Belushi, absolutely, of course, Aykroyd and Belushi put this together. But it's those guys in the band, and also the whole reason why they're there. It's the blues. So let's go to school real quick, my friend. Um, this is a great. Uh, this is a this is a blues timeline I've used in my own classroom before, um, and you, you know you just find it online. But I I'm a you know public high school teacher certified by the state sanctioned. And, um, and I've used the blues to teach U.S. history before and developed an entire 20th century unit on the blues, tracing domestic, you know, uh, upheavals, depression, technological changes, everything from the 1900s all the way to like the 70s, I stop. And uh, it's pretty phenomenal. And so you can see that the blues have been here and, you know, are still alive to, to a great extent. You hear them in everything and every form of music from hip hop to um, you know, the structures of tech, techno, EDM, you know, it's still the same, right? It really is. So, and I think that's, that's where all this, all these tunes come from. And so it's just important to recognize that the, that's, that's what it's about. It's this, um, it's this combination of, of all these forces. And then to talk about how this music then uh, you know, adds horns, you know, though, this is a huge band, as you see those dudes, there's like four horns, you know, in this band. And that just, that is just how blues gets to a new level and kind of how it represents also what about how it represents American history is the, is the integration, I think. Um, and I, and I explicitly use uh, the blues to show how um, moments of integration in American society happen in the music scene far before politics and things integrate us, right? The horrors of, the, of slavery, the horrors of the Civil War don't cure us. You know, what cures us is us. You know, we, we have to cure ourselves and we're still trying to cure ourselves. And so many open-hearted people just used, you know, the church or would also use music as a cure. Like, hey, I got it, you know, let's, let's get together on this commonality. And so, um, and so, as you see these pic pictures, these are these are integrated bands that are that are coming out of the ages. This is the early '60s, uh, late '50s, early '60s, and um, and so, but you're not seeing, you're not even hearing uh, black people on the radio until the 1940s. We're talking King Biscuit Flower Hour. You know about that? Yeah, that was still going on when I was a kid. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it started way back then. Yeah. yeah. I remember listening to a Motley Crue live on the King Biscuit, Biscuit Flower Hour on the radio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They so were badass then. In the eighties. Yeah. And that um, and then yeah, exactly. And then the Memphis radio stations that were uh, that had BB King was a DJ, so was Rufus Thomas, and they would play black music. That was the first all 
black station ever in the in the USA was in Memphis. Huh. Um, now, is that Steve Cropper on on the right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking here at, at a young um, young the Stax Volt uh, singers. This is from uh, this is the the Memphis. Uh, soul sound that was going down there. There's Booker T and the MGs. There's Booker T on the picture on the left. We're seeing that. And then those are the staple singers back there with Daddy and then uh, Mavis. Uh, Daddy's got the guitar. And then that's Duck Dunn with the yeah. with the bass. And then and then Steve Crapper. Oh, okay. He's so he's so slim looking on the right, on the far right. And then uh, they're part of. Uh, uh, they they first start off as this band. If you see the front cover here, this album, the Marquees, they're uh, that's that's their band, and so they're just a groovy band, and they they kind of amalgamate the Marquees is the band with the horn section, and they they had this great horn section, so they were the horn section behind, like um, you know uh, what's a great one, Midnight Hour, like bah, bah, like Midnight Hour is huge. That's them. Um, so all those sounds coming out, you know, try a little tenderness. That's those horns, you know, from Otis Redding. And so, of course, they're the the solid band on the right without the horns. That's Booker T and the MGs. That's the grooving, smooth, you know, Booker T leads that band with his keyboard. And those guys play killer rhythm. I don't remember the name of the drummer of Booker T and the MGs, but... Uh, so, so what I'm saying about the Blues Brothers is, is it's a it's a far out tribute to what blues music and American music is, and I think that is underneath John Belushi's vehicle to have a good time. <laughs> you know, it really is, and that's why we're all and and I mean, and that's why I think I I care about this stuff more than more than most because I see it in here. You know, these guys were vehicles for good way back then, making making trying to make it better for us today. Just you know, obviously, still we haven't cured our racial disharmony but uh -oh. music was a great way to do it this is a great picture eh so this yeah. is this is from the sax gang hanging out uh jamming putting some tunes together you know lord knows what they're what they're making but that's the idea you know just getting together that's really fun booker t and the mgs is based in memphis did you say yeah okay yeah okay. So here, uh, and 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 from around the south, from around the south. Okay. I, I I don't know specifically where, but yeah. So here, this is the this is like you know. So the band is great, but all the other songs, you know, I think they really, you know, I didn't. Uh, I think I did read about it once, but I forget. Like who chose all these songs? So I think it's a combination of Ackroyd and Belushi, but also Schaefer. I think Schaefer had to be, and obviously because of. You know, you're gonna get Cropper and Dunn in, so you got to do Soul Man or so, stuff like that. Um, so, so we're looking at uh, uh, some of the acts that they cover here. Um, so there's the Downchild Blues Band, right? Just a bunch of happy dudes from uh, uh, where's that Lakefield, Ontario. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> they'll they'll light up your Friday night, man. Look at them. <laughs> So, so the guy in the middle, I think, with the mustache, I, I'm gonna, he's Miss Donnie Walsh. He's the leader of the band uh, on guitar in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Masters Blazer, <laughs> or what is that? Is that the uh, Monday Night Football Blazer? Yeah, um, totally. He's there. And so he wrote the tunes that are on this album um, that they cover, and they're great songs, man. They're really great songs. And so they're, they're a shtick. They're a big thing. They are the number one blues band in Canada. They're the most famous blues band in Canada. If you're talking Canadian blues, you can't not talk about the Downchild Blues Band. Wow. I, did, I, I had no idea. You know, so they have a whole establishment. They're in the Canadian Hall of Fames of the blues, Toronto Blues and Jazz Festival, you know. So that's them. And then these other, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's King Floyd. He's a cool dude. So they, they cover this, they do this song Groove Me that's really cool on this album. Did you hear that one? That's the kind of reggae one they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a little silly, you know. It's the one I don't like the most probably. Because Belushi does this bad Jamaican. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. But the accent, it's a mm. little lame. 
And uh, and funny enough, I tried. I think I read it somewhere. I might have read it in this other in that Rolling Stone review. In that song, Groove Me, he makes a Haley Selassie joke, and I don't know. I didn't get it. Um, and I think because this is this this is nineteen eighties, and you know those comedians are always up to date, so they'll throw a joke in if it was yesterday's news, right? And so I and and but he's doing a Jamaican you know, thing. And, you know, Jamaicans love, I mean, Rastafarians love Haley Selassie. I think that there was some scandal involving Selassie. So okay. you hear Belushi oh. sing Haley Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia. Okay. Uh-huh. Who's seen as like, kind of like a, you know, he's the, he's the, he's kind of like a, uh, you know, a very hierarchical uh, figure in the Rastafarian language. Or I'm not, I mean, culture and religion, uh, almost like a, uh, you know, a messiah-ish kind of person, um, Haley Selassie. And he, I think he was caught in a scandal of some kind. Uh, and so, I don't know, Belushi told a joke. I, I don't know. I got to look into it if anybody wants to tell me more about that. I'm down with Haley Selassie, but not like why Belushi would be making a fun of him. <laughs> huh. You know, Did you hear him scream his name? Because I like him. I like Haley Selassie. He's a freedom fighter for uh, African liberation and, you know, freedom from imperialism. Yeah, I'm not sure I caught all that, but um, oh, you did? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to tell you, man, you know, because Belushi's fast, man. I mean, God, we got to get into him eventually. He's crazy. You know, he's sneaking funny jokes in. You can't catch it. Like, what you talking about? Um, but that King Floyd song, he King Floyd is from uh, his his track. His original track is great. And it's got that same groove and it does suggest Caribbean. But the Blues Brothers decided to do it kind of heart a little little more uh reggae so there's junior wells on the bottom he's got a, he's the classic harmonica kind of guy that i guess dan Aykroyd's trying to be um of chicago blues sound and of course there's sam and dave um so was there any um any backlash or any like did did anyone feel like they were kind of appropriating all this and making a buck for themselves? So as you said, they're champ championing the music and promoting these guys. And, you know, these musicians are getting, you know, the musicians in the band, I imagine, are making some nice money off this. The album goes double platinum. But was there any sort of backlash? Like, why are these two white boys uh, making money off? I yeah. I mean, I'm no, no. I, I mean, I think it, it sure it's fodder for that thought about uh, you know appropriation and stuff like that. But I think because you know, one, it's an integrated band. Two, it's it's like because they're uh, they're uh, the members of the band were already like in the scene. You know, I get it. I get it. No, I think uh, I and and I think um um. The music that they were celebrating was still contemporary. You know, yeah. this is the 80s. They're doing songs from the 60s. This is like the birth of the oldies generation, which, you know, there's still a every there's still a station on every dial of the golden oldies. So this is so I don't know. I don't think that came to mind. Mm. I really don't think so. Of course, all uh, these songwriters are probably uh, making money off this too. So yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's good yeah, the Down Child Blues Band, especially. <laughs> But this was a, I mean, Soul Man did so well. And then, of course, the movie does great for everybody. I mean, this this really, it becomes a vehicle because the people love it. I think we loved it. We loved, yeah, yeah, for, for many rate and for many reasons, uh, we loved it. I think so. Um, wow. Because um, for because he chose these songs because these are these deep cuts. You know, everyone knew Sam and Dave. Um, but, uh, and probably everybody knew I, I turn you loose. That was an oldest writing standard. However, the other songs are real deep cuts. Um, you know, King, this King Floyd song never hit the charts big. This is a, uh, you know, this was, you know, yeah. Anyway, you know, these, all these guys have interesting careers and they're great careers, but none of their, but these are deep tracks on, of them, you know, it's so. It's really interesting, except Flip Flop Fly. That's probably the biggest song besides Soul Man. Uh, if we look at the, the list here, Flip Flop Fly, that's Big Joe Turner. 
he's a boss. And you look at the years here, him and Floyd Dixon are the oldest dudes here. Well, Willie Maybaum, of course. But um, and that's a great song. They have fun with that. Um, I think uh, is that the one we're going to listen to? I think that might be the one we're going to listen to that Willie Maybaum song. So. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's uh, before we go any further, let's listen to a track. Why don't we? OK. Mm. All right. And, uh, you know, listen to one that really features the band. And uh, and uh, that would be that would be awesome. So let's get set up for for a track. OK, sure, sure. Okay, so we're going to hear a track real quick that features the uh, horn section and just features how tight this band gets. Uh, you're going to hear Belushi do some banter. Uh, really, Belushi's not a bad singer. Let's get over it. You know, you give him some credit and you really hear him pulling it off here. So this is I Don't Know, um, the Willie Maybon tune. Willie Maybon is a Chicago blues uh, guy. Probably some of Belushi, you know, Belushi's bringing some of this Chicago blues influence, I think, to this set list. So, uh, so let's have a listen to this. So definitely feature, and also featuring, I mean, Ackroyd on the harmonica is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, subst you know, I don't know. It's not insignificant, you know, <laughs> so it's great. He plays it well. Let's hear it. Paul Schaefer on the keyboard. Fantastic. Sick and tired by the way you do. Good time, Papa, gonna poison you. Spring a goop of dust all around your bed. Wake up on these days, find your own self dead. She said, you shouldn't say that. I said, what did I say to make you mad this time, baby? Ah! She said, I don't know my own right or mine. She said, I don't know what my head is putting down. A woman I love, she got dimple and a jaw. Clothes she wear made out of the best of cloth. She can take him and wash him, put him up beside the wall. She can throw him out the window, pick him up a little bit before the fall. Sometimes I think you got your habits on. She said, you shouldn't say that. I said, well, what did I say to piss you off this time, babe? She said, mm -hmm. Young man, you have many women you got. Awesome stuff, man. Awesome stuff. Um, I thought I thought maybe there was a uh, there was a, there's a, more solos later on. I think that's one of the some of these songs are pretty long because they got a lot of solos in them. That's why these just, what why these are such fun, great songs, and why the blues and jazz is so fun is that they're wide open, right? They're just wide open songs that are well written. And the space for like solos and flourishes is all over the place. So that's a fun song um, uh, to do. That's the uh, the oldest song they covered, right? It's 1952. Yeah, it's going back. <laughs> and 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 it's and it's the internal tale. Um, if you're listening to the words of that song, you know Belushi lives that tale. It's probably why he pulled it. It's like the smart ass guy talking to uh women you know to his woman who's you know upstanding superhero of domestic strength <laughs> you know he describes her uh, as a, a queen of the house 
and you know he's trying to live up to it you know and he can't <laughs> that's a great song oh my god so uh so yeah 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 it's i mean these these songs and this music are so important and i mean i just love and, and i think it, it it is it needs to be uh it needs to be straightened out that that even though you know this is touched by Ackroyd and Belushi, bunch of comedians, that this is a music project, you know, that they're not in it to dick around. Now, if you want to talk about dicking around, um, because the blues is not dicking around, these songs are not dicking around. This is kind of dicking around. So if you want to talk about <laughs> getting your dicks out and dicking around, uh, and and vaginas straight up. Now we see some vaginas in the house. So if you see my screen, honey boy, I, yeah. I was, uh, we were talking before this came on. I asked you if you knew of the lemmings. No. And you were like, maybe not. And uh, so, uh, so here they are. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure some people here, the lemmings have a documentary that came out in the last 10 years or so. Um, you're looking at it and it's, um, and so this is coming about national lampoons is a thing. That started what late sixties? I want to say early seventies. You know, out of Harvard, right? I, I don't know much about the the history of it. Yeah, something like that. Some you know, so, something like that. Um, but uh, it's a comedy troupe, and so they ended up um, getting together. It was I think it was mostly written by these people that you're seeing here, uh, Mark Jacobs. But it's like a comedy um, uh, uh, shtick. Uh, it's a show. It's like an off Broadway play but they're musicians and what they do is this whole it's it's great it's it's available you can watch it live it's like 40 minutes it's on youtube you can listen to it the soundtrack but it's look at the year it's 1973 it's a live mockery of woodstock okay huh. and so the whole show is like woodstock like woodstock has stage announcements <laughs> and woodstock has these amazing you know inspirational acts but Woodstock is also coded with the hippie dream. And so this is 1973. How'd that hippie dream go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they're, they're running a rod up the ass of hippies because the lemmings, that's what, that's what they're saying hippies are. Wow. <laughs> like just a bunch of swimming lemmings. <laughs> so, and the idea, the shtick is that they're all there to kill, e to kill themselves. And so a lot of the lads say, hey, we've all come here together to do it. you know. And it's, I think it's also because the Kool-Aid acid test maybe yeah. might have happened around here, around these years. And, you know, it's just, it's as, as, the, as the poster there says. Wow. Satirical joke, rock mock concert. So <laughs> they do, so the different songs satirize different acts. Uh, I have a clip ready to go that we'll watch <laughs> that satirizes Bob Dylan. There's, you know, they do like a James Taylor shtick where they're singing like a song and then they're making fun of his heroin addiction. They do a, they do like a Motown shtick. This is 1973. And they make a couple Motown jokes about how they're getting old. That's kind of funny. Like the huh. temptations are getting old. Um, and they, and oh, so pretty, so pretty funny. And, and, and so a lot of the jokes are like rich, man. They're mocking like the hippies. And, and that's funny to hear that, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. 350 live performances. So Saturday Night Live started in 75. Is that right? Yeah. So this is before okay. so that. Two, yeah. two years before Saturday Night Live. Um, wow. So I mean, so just to perform that many shows, I mean, Belushi must have been an, an, a decent bass player at the, uh, in Chevy Chase. <laughs> so that, I mean, right. they, they must have been yeah. all right, right? Wow. The song, I mean, they, you know, in total, there's probably about ten, eight or 10 songs, but a lot of shtick, a lot of shtick in between. So we're okay. not going to watch a lot of it um, because it, it does, you know, it's silly. It'd be fun and electric to be a part of because, like, like, it's a lot of improv, it, you know. But what I do think is just fascinating about this, the, you know, it, is this, this is like really like the style of humor that's seemed to continue on, like humor's continued in this direction since. Mm. Um, uh, and look at these people, because, I mean, we know who the hell uh, Belushi, but Chevy Chase, you know, remarkable. Christopher Getz, good God, you know, he's, he's touched so many things. 
Um, mm. And so, okay, I guess we'll talk about this now. So this is this is crazy. Chevy Chase is on the drums here. All right, this is some deep, some deep white rock trivia. Are you ready for this? So Chevy Chase, I don't know if you know his story. Uh, you know, he's he grows up kind of like rich kid, but has a tough time growing up, getting kicked out of schools. He goes to like a, a boarding school and eventually goes to like uh, some some college, Haverford College. I never heard of that, but anyway, he's 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 jamming in bands. He's also doing comedy and stuff and and stuff, but he's also jamming in bands and he plays uh, keyboard sometimes and he plays drums. He's jamming with a band and his buddies in college, uh, and they're you know they're in a band called you know what they're called Leather Cannery. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and you know who's in that band with him? His two college buddies, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. Oh. Steely Dan. You know who they are? Is it Steely Dan? Yeah. Chevy Jace's college, you know, band is the founding members of Steely Dan. So I'm listening to this Lemmings album and I'm like, that's some snappy drums. What's going on there? And sure enough, I dig in and find this information. One of them says he has uncanny timing. <laughs> wow. One yeah, of them, you mean one guy. of the Steely Dan guys says that about Chevy? Yeah, one wow. of the Dan's. Yeah. Huh. Amazing, amazing. So I had no wow. idea. And I, and and of course also Belushi's bass player. And way to go. I, I really didn't think he played a lot. Um so uh so let's 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 see a live a quick uh, a quick live performance because this is where Belushi got his uh cocker stick from. That, that's Lemmings. what I was and gonna then, ask because you said they were yeah, mocking Woodstock, and I'm like, Oh, that must have been where he started doing the cocker thing, right? Because right. he he would right. do that on Saturday Night Live too, right? Exa yeah, yeah, exactly. With Joe Cocker at one point. <laughs> right. yeah. So I'm going to cue it up here for you kids. But just forget it. He's a personal friend of mine, and he said he wasn't going to show up. All right? What? Serious. You make me look like a fucking asshole, man. I just told him I knew the guy. He's here. Okay, okay, all right. He's here. Bob is here. He's out there somewhere. Bob, where are you, Bob? You son of a gun, where are you? God damn, I don't believe it. Bob is out there. Bob, where are you? Bob, where is he? I know he's out there, man. There he is, over there. Hey, Bob, come on up here, Bob, and famous with a tune. What do you say, Bobby? Come on up here. Come on, let's give him some encouragement. Let's get him up here. Come on, let's hear it. Come on, here he comes. Here he comes. Uh, uh, there you go. Bob, one, two, Bob. Uh, he's not coming up. He's not coming up. I'll get him up here. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Bob. Hey. Bob, Come on up, Bob. Sold, sold his catalog for how many millions? Hmm. Enough, Bob. Enough. <laughs> God, I don't believe it's bad. out behind the barn <laughs> it goes on and on it's pretty darn good i walked the dog to it the other day and then there's there's some funny sticks and it's like good music like they're caring about the music and then he eventually mocks hippies and i think he's behind the barn doing silly things and so so the songs are half serious and then half satire it's 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 great stuff fucking it and it, it, it was a hit so and that's Christopher Guest is Bob there or 
No, sorry. That's uh, that's this guy, Paul Jacobs. Okay. All right. Uh, Christopher Getz does some other stuff. He plays the role of Max Yazgar. <laughs> Huh. Uh, you know the the silly farmer. He's he does some great guitar work uh, later. So um, we're not going to watch a ton of that stuff, but it it shows the roots of this stuff. Like Belushi's been a part of some serious theatrical musical things. You know, some of the Lemmings people. I remember there was a, like a Godspell. Uh, like a lot of them were part of Godspell. I don't think Belushi was, but I know that some of the other people that they were working with in those years. Which was hot then, right? In the late 60s, Godspell was. So Belushi and uh, Chevy Chase would be in their early 20s at that time? 73? Is that about Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Huh. So like you said, 75, of course, comes. And then here comes Saturday Night Live. And so, uh, and so Chevy Chase is part of the uh, not-so-ready-for-prime-time players. This is a fantastic picture in 1976. Huh. <laughs> so there's Lauren Michaels. Uh, in uh, next to Chevy, and then a, a a nice woman, a pretty woman. Does she look familiar? No, I'm not. I'm not sure who that is. Yeah, I'm She's not a cast she, member. I don't, I don't think. I think I would recognize the cast members. I'd recognize her. Yeah. Hmm. And then of course there's Dan Aykroyd with the perfect stash and the glasses, and then John Belushi. Oh my God! And then Gerald Ford. Hmm. That. That expression of John Belushi's just kills me every time. That's an amazing facial expression he's got on. <laughs> oh my god! Could I mean to to you know and <laughs> you know and because Gerald Ford I think is in mid sentence you know talking so mm. <laughs> you know and what oh my god that's great and so this was at some like uh, media American Media Associations of American you know event broadcasting company event so gerald ford happened to be there i think this is post president ford so he's kind of on the on the way down huh you think uh Ackroyd and belushi are high in this photo <laughs> my money's on it my money's on <laughs> soaring like a mormon you know. <laughs> i mean ackroyd has got his glasses on i mean my yeah. god yeah absolutely that's fantastic stuff. Now, is you it, know, again, I mean, I don't want. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, isn't Lauren Michaels Canadian? Is that right? Or I don't know. Just you might be onto something. Yeah. When we were when yeah. we were talking about that connection to the what were they called? Downchild Blues Band. Um, Downchild Blues Band. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if uh, just these. Well, who was the Canadian connection on Saturday Night Live? It's um, Lauren Michaels. Uh, Al, Al, uh, the Paul Schaefer's Canadian. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe all these guys wanted to give the uh, the down child blues band some. Uh... And I want to say Ackroyd is Canadian, but I'm not 100 percent on that. Is he Chicago? Because he plays Chicago, but I know he's he he knew all those Canadian guys, you know. Yeah. From yeah. SCTV, yeah. From SCTV and uh, yeah, that's that's right. Well, SCTV is yeah. Chicago, but but what was the what was the Canadian uh, network? No, there? you're right though. That SC, SCTV that um, oh. that show right with John Candy and right. Eugene Levy and all that, and of course uh, John yeah, yeah, Candy's exactly. in the Blues Brothers movie, right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the whole top. the whole gang. Orange Whip, Orange Whip. Yeah, yeah. So here, so you know, so the Blues Brothers eventually, you know, obviously, you know, the the music using music as as real time entertainment, taking taking comedy to another level. Okay, so there's Belushi in in SNL mid seventies. This is seventy five. I think the the King D appears in seventy five seventy six. The skit does for the first time. Watch this. I mean, Saturday Night Live is going down as, you know, this is, we're talking Simpsons level. We're talking Price is Right level, epic uh, sustainability of television entertainment. You know, I mean, there's, there's not a lot still going, you know. Yeah. As long as Saturday Night Live has been going. So, but what we're, what we're seeing here with the King Bee, did you know this? What did you know about the King Bee? First reoccurring segment ever. Oh, really? Huh. You're hearing it here, folks. Okay, and they did that before. That becomes, yeah, before the Blues Brothers, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is really them getting their uh, getting their act together, 
And it's the dumbest thing because first I think they're, I mean, they, they come off as a band, but then they start showing up and just doing B puns. <laughs> yeah. So it's outrageous to see so many humans dressed in a B outfit. And that's the whole thing. Like, oh, we got the costume guy. <laughs> you know? I got all this yellow and black material. <laughs> <laughs> And and so there they are, and so it becomes a re the reoccurring dumb thing, you know. So it's so funny, but it it is it teaches Belushi like, oh my God, look what we can do. <laughs> I I have this so, idea okay. that that Belushi was also a punk fan, right? Like, didn't he arrange to have Fear play on Saturday Night Live, or is is that right? You got that right. Okay. You got that right. Hmm. Yeah. He's all over the place, man. He's all over the place. I mean, it, now that we're talking Belushi, man, I friggin', I'm in one of those uh, take a book, uh, drop a book off, or uh, don't drop a book off <laughs> places. And I just took a book. Uh, I I may have returned a book someday. And I grabbed Wired by none other than who? Carl Bernstein wrote that, I think. Who's one of the Watergate cats? Um, Woodward and Bernstein. Woodward? Woodward and Bernstein. It could, okay, it was either Bob. Okay, <laughs> it was either Bob. It was Jake or Elwood, or Bob Woodward or Carl Bernstein wrote this book. Uh, it's a biography of John Belushi. It's fantastic. Wow, definitely worth reading. But he he tried to push fear so much, like to get them record executive deals. He would be so high and burned out, and he'd be up in Atlantic's like offices, like playing the tape or something and like oh, i want a meeting <laughs> so funny wow were they that good but also of a band? horrible so were, were they that good of a band oh, oh yeah okay uh-huh fear yeah, yeah great I band know. okay uh-huh yeah if you like that kind of you know straight ahead uh straight ahead stuff sure okay sure uh -huh. so um so yeah he was also into that but i, I think his roots were, were in this kind of stuff uh, too but um, I mean he was this kind of electric character that I mean it was the shock value of a band named Fear and then he would ride it like that and just you know listen to this it was, it was one of those things where that, where that was his thing to carry it around and make people listen to it but uh, hmm. so oh, but at SNL so do you recognize that that picture on the top right and who's who do, who do you think's in there <laughs> okay so that's from the, the King Tut right? Yeah. That um, skit with Steve Martin used to do. Um, so so that's uh, Blue Lou on the sax? That's Blue Lou Marini. That's right. Okay. Dude, he, you know, and I'm, I mean, there's so many things to, to talk about and watch, you know, but yeah, you gotta, I mean, I, I showed that King Tut video to my kids one time and they were, they were laughing. Uh, and then he, he busts it out of that uh what do you call that coffin what do you call it <laughs> oh mummy's sure coffin it's yeah coffin dracula's living coffins what do mummies live in tombs casket uh -huh. no casket yeah but there is a word for that sarcophagus no, something King like that's buried in a we could roll with that tomb <laughs> yeah he's in he's in the nice little russian doll person tomb and I mean, but here's the funny thing. Steve Martin starts that shtick. You know, he's out there talking and he's going. And then it's like two and a half minutes into the song before Blue Lou Marini's sax solo. He's in there the whole time, like totally squished in there with his saxophone. Look at there's no give on the door. He's smashed in there with a with a live mic, no doubt. And he can't, he busts out that solo so good. It's amazing. And he's got the... Uh, you know, he's got the bangles dancing out there in front of him. It's a, it's an amazing uh, 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 video, and he's so good in that. So look at him down here. And there you got the Saturday Night Live band. Um, I don't know all those dudes' names, except for the two on the ends. Uh, so I know the, the goalpost guys are uh, – that's Paul the Shiv Schaefer on the left with those big Elton John glasses trying to cover up his forehead. And then that's Blue Lou who could give Paul some of his hair. And then those dudes in the middle, I don't recognize them. So uh, anyhow, 
awesome stuff. So this, this this is the roots of this band, man. That's what I'm saying. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff going on that is making this possible. And then sure enough, it it they they decide to do it. And so I mean, they this their first performance is 1978 season four. Uh, they uh, they do this album uh, uh, soon after. I, I want to say like. You know, six months after they get a, they get the band together slowly with the help of Paul. Uh, they're like, let's do a special thing for the show, like for musical guests, like, and they do this. What we're about to watch, you want to watch it? Sure, sure. It's incredible. All right, so yeah. this is the joint, man. What I'm saying is that when and when you hear this is Donald Duck done, you see him behind here, right? And also, we, we also got to shout out the theatrics. Now we're seeing the suits and we see this kind of thing, you know, but this was part of the image and a lot of bluesmen had this thing. But what they're doing is they're, they're imitating, yet they're, they're pulling together all the shticks. There were so many common duos like Sam and Dave, but there were also, they always wore suits and everybody knew that. Everybody knew the a serious bluesmen wore suits and, and, you know, Robert Johnson was photographed famously, you know, wearing that suit. And um, and so this was a serious thing. And so, uh, but when you hear Donald Duck Dunn's bass kick in here, it's phenomenal, right? They, this is so. What we're about to hear is just the uh, the opening. I can't turn you loose. The Otis Redding number. Otis Redding wrote this with Duck Dunn, but it, Duck Dunn wrote the bass line with Otis. I don't know who wrote it. Real, real. Um, and then also you get to see Garrett Morris here because yeah. so so on the on the album. Dan Aykroyd is doing this awesome talk. You know how Dan Aykroyd can do that fast talking stuff. Yeah, Garrett Morris does, and then the and then the guys come out and they do, uh, and then they they go into Hey Bartender. So um, so again, this is the first incarnation of the band, and so let's check it out. Uh, it's so electric, and again, I remember this. Um, you know, I'm not going to say like it was yesterday, but I I remember seeing this and feeling this when I saw them live. It was it was exactly like this. You know, they did the whole shtick, Belushi with the cartwheels, um, several cartwheels. In fact, I remember him coming, there being like some kind of long catwalk, and he did even two cartwheels, like dugadun, dugadun. It was, it was remarkable. Wow. Here we go.
do it there. Amazing, right? Amazing. And he says, uh, play it, Steve, you know, just like Sam and Dave do in the original Soul Man. And it's the same Steve, right? It's Steve Cropper. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, and I think that's what that's what really that's what really legitimizes so much of this is that those are the the hundred you know Cropper and Dunn and then Matt Guitar Murphy. Those are that those are the real dudes. That's like putting a that's like when these guys try to say, Hey, let's make MC five. And it's like, what? You want to try to recreate MC five? Oh yeah, but we're gonna do it with these dudes. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you could do it. <laughs> Mm. We're the guys that are, you know, when Wayne Kramer decides to, you know, get some friends together to make MC5, yeah, we'll make it work, you know, <laughs> you know, so when these guys, you know, hey, we're going to do a blues review and it's legit, yeah, it's legit, it's it's really friggin' legit, right, I mean, they're so tight, it's amazing. I like um, so, Aykroyd's moves, for, for a tall guy, <laughs> he, he, uh, yeah. he makes it work. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Give me a break. It's 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 really it's really it's really incredible. And I mean, Dunn's uh, when when the band kicks in there, it it just it's just incredible uh, how tight they are. Um, you know, just uh, I just kind of want to highlight the band again. Um, they're just so dang tight, you know, coming in like that, and it's so fast, right? And I think when you listen to Otis's versions of that, and when you listen to Booker T and the MGs cover that song, it's slower, you know. So these guys do it more electric. They do it on coke, basically. You know, it's like there's an urgency to a lot of these songs. It's really fast. You know, I don't know. It's um, it's, it's remarkable. Live TV urgency too. In in that case, SNL, right? I mean, yeah, that's true. Every yeah. everyone's a yeah, everyone's a little yeah. It it is live. You're absolutely right. Um, You're absolutely right. Wait, so, so um, would it be a stretch to say that? Um, so, when I remember you as a live performer in the early '90s, uh, fronting mm -hmm. Protex Blue, is there a bit of an echo of uh, Belushi in your stage presence? Oh boy, yeah, you're getting into it now. No doubt about it. I, th I, I think, yeah, you're, you're seeing. You know, <laughs> as we talk about John Belushi. Absolutely, and my friends w would probably attest to it. I was the guy that downstairs in the basement, you know, late being the loudest that the father would come down and shh, Fox, be quiet, you know. You know, at least that kind of boisterous kind of, you know, thing. Yes, yes. But as far as en entertainer, sure, like emceeing sort of style. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And as I prepared for this, I, I really, I, I see it too. And also my love of the blues and my, my passion, my, my feeling like it's a mission to, to talk. I mean, when I get up talking about the blues and I'm talking to these hip hop kids of the 21st century millennial generation, you know, and they, you know, they want to, I give them the blues, you know, by telling them about it, you know, mm. but when we start making connections to Lamar, um, you know, to, to, um, to Nas and to Jay Z when I play them most deaf songs that reference blues, you know, we, we got to sneak it in. And then by the time we get to Jimi Hendrix, right? And he's like, you know, I'm standing on the side of a mountain, I'll chop it down with the side of my hand, you know, oh my God, you know, that's the blues too. And so, so anyway, we get there for sure. So you're right, man. And, and when you're talking about me, yeah, we, we are talking about the birth of. Of, of Montgomery Fox here. And uh, so my, so when this thing comes out in 1987, or no, what, what did we say? It comes out 78. 78. Yeah. Um, you know, my parents um, get the album, but then I also had it on, uh, I had it on, uh, that's called an 8-track, kids. And so wow. I had it on 8-track in 79. I probably got it at 79 or 80, uh, an 8-track. And, um, and so I didn't have, you know, an eight track player. There was maybe an eight track player in the car, um, but I had a couple eight tracks of music. But this, did you ever know about this guy, Honey Boy? This I didn't have that. Pick. No, <laughs> it looks awesome. It's called 2XL. This was cutting edge technology. So um, evidently, eight tracks 
are called, um, I mean, is that what that's called? An eight track? Right? Yeah. I mean, what are those? Yeah. It's called an eight track because there's literally tracks or something inside it. So when you push buttons, you're switching the reels or something. Someone, people know about how eight tracks work. I don't, but it, it was magic to me. Okay. So you put an eight track inside this robot, it talks to you. And then based on the buttons you push, there's games and activities and trivia. It was awesome. Really? So for an only child like me, yeah. So for an only child like me, this was hours of fun. My friend to excel. And he had the most annoying robot voice. Voice. My parents hated it. They told jokes all the time about it. <laughs> I um, got it some Christmas. Wait, so you're saying there's material on the A track that wasn't on the album, like jokes and no, 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 no. I'm telling you, I'm telling sorry. You see the picture. You can play an album on 2XL. Okay. Or you buy the you buy the 2XL games and activities. Oh, that's what this stuff is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the stuff on the left, you see that when the one inside of his belly is yeah. called general information. <laughs> so <laughs> that was trivia and lessons about general information. <laughs> really? I don't know if they talked about like, you know, cups and half a cup and a quarter cup. I don't know. But look at the one on the right. That might be, uh, I can't see it there. Oh, uh, I don't know, but there was a sports one. There was a, you know, world geography one. There were all sorts of ones. It was just the biggest fun for an only child. Wow. You know nothing about this, you know, house full of uh, brothers and sisters. No, we didn't We didn't have a track. I mean, we went from vinyl and then uh, over to cassettes. Yeah, but there was no, I never, I don't remember a single a track in our house ever. Um, no, so. nor did you have robot companions. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Um, you do now Bahama, don't you <laughs> yeah yeah you should see if uh, you could buy this on on ebay <laughs> i know it's gonna be like those same things i have a warm memory and i want to keep it there like you know you bring home these atari games and it's interesting for five and a half minutes you know <laughs> you know and you start playing it you know, you start playing and you're like okay where's my ps4 you know get me out of here Anyway, but it was a trip, and two two XL is is a, is a riot, you know. And so I do know that I listened to not only did I listen to because I don't think I you know I could go and play a record at any time, but I did get the parents bought me a Blues Brothers uh, um, eight track, and so I could play it in the two XL at any time. And notice how it breaks the album up, you know. I had four sides. Mm. <laughs> But it's the same size pizza. It's just cut up in four ways. I know, and I, I still, you know what? Uh, I have this right downstairs. The, it's displayed. The, uh, yeah. Blues, the Blues Brothers 8-track. Nice. I want to say yes, but I'm, I'm not going to run and get it, and I'm not going to. Hmm. But I do. Uh, I know I had a little Richard 8-track, too. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I loved to. I bought I bought my uh, childhood Browns hat on... Uh, on ebay new how about that yeah did you have one of these when you were a kid i mean this style For sure this series of yeah yeah i felt i wanted one and uh yeah ebay new it was like wrapped uh 25 bucks so uh, yeah it's oh, that's it, swell it's fun to get stuff from your from your childhood <laughs> oh man i went to town with that when i got when we did star wars when we got into star wars with my kids um that was a, a, such a good time Mm. And so then, sure enough, um, I'm eight years old, and I'm clearly enjoying the records. And I'm, I'm, this is my first entry into music with my parents, and they were playing music, and I'm starting to understand music, whatever, listening to it. And whatever, I'm eight years old, and we go to, uh, and, my, and my dad decides to bring me to Meriwether Post Pavilion, one of these outdoor pavilion-type uh, uh, concerts. But it's, it's at night, you know. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure um, we had seats in the pavilion. We okay. weren't just out on the lawn um, because the second time we had gone there twice that year. Uh, and this, and, and I forget which one was first. I'm pretty sure this was first. And then we had such a good time. We went back and then we had better seats for the second show. Do you know what the second show was? It was either an 80 or 81. I was really close. 
we went and saw Shanana. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, good, okay. good time. So, so there, there's something about performative historical American musical reviews that I really, <laughs> yeah, 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 got in, got into, you know, early. You know, I remember <laughs> that your your dad was excited when that Commitments movie came out, right? Hey, we're... yeah, nice. yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, Jim Fox, shout out. Um, he loved the commitments for that reason. It's that it's got the same Blues Brothers appeal. Hmm. It really does. It's a celebration. So uh, um, now, now, Shana now was kind of geared toward kids, right? Because I remember there being like a show, you know, at like 7 p.m. or something that I yeah. like, I remember watching it. Whereas like Blues Brothers was, I would imagine there are people, you know, I mean, okay, were you like the only kid there? <laughs> I think I was probably the only kid there. I mean, wow. I can't imagine. People were smoking grass. Yeah, uh, I would and, think. And I, I recall asking my dad what that what, what was that? And that was a story he kept telling afterwards. Because, you know, my I come from this generation of storytellers, and you hear the same story told. You know, because you're running, you know, how'd it go at yeah, the concert? Oh, but da but da with those funny cigarettes, you know. And, and you know, be like funny jokes, you know. So, yeah, I heard that one a lot, you know. But the, the what I kept always telling people was, oh, my God, yes. That opening of I Can't Turn You Loose into – not hey bartender, which is what I was ready for, you know. Like I'm, I'm sitting here like an early like, whatever, just music fan, you know. I'm ready for the set list. Like I know that they're gonna play. I can't turn you loose, and then they're gonna play hey bartender, and you know. <laughs> but they punch me with everybody needs somebody to love. I had no idea what that song was. I just remember it jolting the shit out of me. And because when they come out to I can't turn you loose, it was just like the record, just. I, I had no idea what was happening. It was incredible. It was incredible electric, you know. I just remember that. That's probably my only sheer memory of the show because I was eight, you know. Yeah, I well, don't remember. You, you but I, just I remember being eight too, right? So your birthday was just recently, right? So you're like eight and one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm barely making memories, you know, in yeah, seventh yeah, yeah. grade, you know. Yeah. Uh, so um so yeah i mean but what a hell of a show they play everything off of the record so i must have just been in dreamland digging this record um i don't think i fell asleep or anything you know like that um and then they play everything else you know green onions they play uh stuff from the movie they, this was this this was their second tour so they're pushing the movie a lot hmm. with this so a lot i like of the, she, she a lot of the chatty tracks. i always like that that taj mahal song they do totally yeah um, yeah, Daniel Johnston does a snippet of that on um, right the fun album, which we discussed in episode one of Blown Speaker. He does, uh, yeah, he does a bit of that. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Who's making love? Yeah, this is quite a yeah, so it's a I'm long show too, system. huh? <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, and so uh, I got one more treat from you from this show, but then I, uh, but it, and also this was uh, supporting their uh, second album, American Made. Um, first they supported, after Briefcase was a hit, they supported it, made a lot of money. And then out came the movie and their next album, American Made. So they're supporting American Made. And I want to say that that song, they do a Randy Newman song. So that's fun. Like they're, they're pulling up some contemporary uh, shtick as well, uh, you know, which is which is great. Uh, but they do that. But that's a, that's like a slow John Belushi song. Um, and again, this is downward spiral days of John Belushi. You know, it's it's really. I mean, he still got it together to put this kind of thing together, and this might be his last. Some of his last functioning stuff i mean because in the last two years of his life like the making of the making of the movie was hard these tours were hard um definitely the movie was hard i heard because he was just hard to get there on time and stuff and then every movie afterwards like the making of neighbors was hard the making of continental divide which i think was his last maybe um right am i right about that it's right about that it was straight around there Oh, um, you mean uh, what he was working on when he died? Is that what you're asking? 
Yeah, um, yeah, something uh, like that. So, uh, uh, so isn't there that what, a World War Two movie? Wasn't there one like called 1942 or something like that? Um, oh, maybe because hmm. he's living hard these days and his body's yeah. still doing it. And and I wanted to say also that I mean the choice of songs. I mean the blues is dark, but it can be celebratory. Stuff like Solomon Burke's song and songs that like celebrate partying because he does <laughs> feature a lot of those songs like Hey Bartender. <laughs> mm. <laughs> These are all songs about abuse, you know, either self-abuse or dark as shit, I'm about to kill myself kind of shit, you know. Like it's there's some heavy topics in all of these songs, and they're they're, you know. And what's crazy is like you hear the crowds just like living through it, you know. Mm. <laughs> uh, but but, it, but you know, it looks like they end on a high note though. Jeez, they do j uh, jailhouse rock always before an right. encore, and then uh, come back, flip flop fly, yeah. soul man, and then wow, go out with the Otis Redding. That's quite quite an encore there. Yeah, fantastic encore. I do. I do. Was it just you and your dad, or was your mo your mom was also there for this? No, it's just my dad and I. Really? Wow, that's yeah. great. I mean, I wonder if there was a moment where he felt, "Gee, maybe I shouldn't have brought my kid to this." Did did he, <laughs> did he ever feel that way? Or sure. did he, okay. <laughs> I mean, he may not admit it. Um, yeah. Um, but. Um, I'm sure you felt it, you know, yeah. it might, it might even gotten stares at, you know, Yeah. it's not like I was a, a tall kid. Um, but yeah, like shotgun blues, which is one of the great down child blues band songs, which is track nine here at the, on the set list. That's the one that features Matt guitar Murphy. Really, really good. That's a really tough song. And I mean, any song called shotgun blues is going to be a bad, tough song. And that one is, I, Montgomery Fox myself, have a song called Shotgun. Uh, it's not Shotgun Blues, but it's just, it features a shotgun. And yeah, it's never any good when a shotgun shows up in a song or a story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe Shotgun Wedding songs are nice. I, when There's you a, said that, Billy, Billy Idol went through my head. Little sister shotgun. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun right. song, right? Mm. White weddings are, are good things to, to to do. So yeah, I, I I was really happy, and I and I think that this this laid down a long road for me. You and you 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 were right to to smell that out, and so I uh, that this was the birth of Montgomery Fox. So I went ahead and found uh, Mike Joyce from the Smiths. I guess used to write for the Washington Post. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, Mike Joyce. But I found the concert review uh, that I that I went to see. Um, so this is this is what helps you make a memory, you know, having reporters on the scene for things you've done. All right, just just <laughs> just just a moment, Fox. Just yeah, um, yeah. So to me, it's so interesting that your father took you to a concert like this when you were eight, because in in our house there was a rule: we were not allowed to go to concerts until we were eighteen. Eighteen, and um, oh, wow, and I think it was without parental supervision. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but they weren't going to take us to my dad. Um, so I never got the full story, but um, you know, he was a high school teacher. And at one point, he took a group of kids to uh, to Blossom, I think, where I used to go to see Lollapalooza. Um, nice. He took a group of high school kids to a Doobie Brothers concert in the seventy ah. some point, and I don't know what I don't know Woo. what I don't know what he saw there or what went down. But he he came out of that situation thinking my kids are not going to concerts, <laughs> so I should I should try to get to the bottom of that story. I don't I don't know what he saw exactly. Well, that's fantastic. Well, you know how much of a um, a, a father Henningman reach around that is. <laughs> the Doobie Brothers band is the Stax Volts. The backing uh, the Doobie Brothers played for Atlantic and Stax Records. They were on the label. And which carried Booker T and all those guys. Like they're they were part of that scene down there. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's uh, but yeah, well, yeah, I, our fathers are of the same uh, bracket, um, uh, and uh, and so they they may have had that same zeal. But your father, I guess, might have learned a lesson at the Doobie Brothers <laughs> concert. 
Hence All the right. name. But yeah, yeah like, like I said, I was exposed a bit there too. You know what I also didn't recognize is that this was 4th of July weekend. Mm. <laughs> this concert was in the 4th of July weekend because the review came out the next day on, on the 3rd. Um, so was it was it on the 4th? Um, uh, oh, was, maybe, yeah, maybe. July 3rd. Oh, July 3rd. Yeah, so the concert was on July 3rd. So the okay. 4th of July was the next day. What a weekend for an eight-year-old. Okay, all know. right. This is a double shot of America, man. And here I am teaching U.S. history. Like, this is how things happen, kids. So so Mike Joyce from the Smiths writes this review. Um, thankfully, he was there to record my life for me. And uh, and it's everything you thought it was. I mean, I you know, you can, you can sit here and read this if you want. But what's funny is the, some of the highlighted things. The Blues Brothers sustained a level of energy and excitement they never came close to achieving in their recent movie. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> what a great dig, huh? Yeah. Because I think it emphasizes, because that movie does meander, and I think people mocked it for like, is this movie over? Like, it kept going. It is long. Remember, it is long. I remember Good. falling asleep to that movie, um, you know, and it had a little Lord of the Rings to it, you know? <laughs> Part three, whichever one that was uh, Oh, I thought that was a funny dig from Mike Joyce from the Smiths. That's hilarious. Mm. And so, um, and the, the, you know, and, and, and also the opening line, look at the opening line, call them what you will. Yeah. Call them what you will. I was going to ask, what do you think? Yeah. What does he mean? Because he knows, he knows there must've been some mockery both for, you know, maybe music snobs, like you suggested, you know, you know, the Clapton is God crowd or the, <laughs> <laughs> or the what are these white fucks doing crowd or the you know or of course these are comedians right yeah so somebody, somebody's pushing back you know obviously well, well think about how dismissive we would have been okay like when we were when we were university students if um <laughs> you know the guys from wayne's world you know like mike oh, myers and dana carvey of those two like oh no we're starting a metal band and even if they got you know, the bassists from Aerosmith or, you know, like they just got some all-star band together. I mean, we would not Did give they? that. I'm saying if they, I, they might have, but I mean, we yeah, would not I give that the time of day, right? <laughs> You're right. We wouldn't. <laughs> no, like when you were saying like Sha Na Na was a kid show, like I'd like to see, I mean, what's Dave Grohl doing today? But like putting rock and roll in front a lesson to learn he's not sticking it up or is he you know there's a there's a i hate dave Grohl crowd out there that's really funny that might say hey shanana you're dumbing down the music and you're turning this into a snack you know rather than you know the music is real man don't fake this with this and and you know the way dave Grohl pedals rock and roll and punk i don't know you know yeah, what I mean. I, I actually don't. I actually don't know what you're talking about. What, what do you mean, the Foo Fighters or something else? Yeah, like you know, people become posters for the culture and the music they represent. That's what Shanana became, and so right. they were commercialized. And I think 100% Dave Grohl has taken possession. I mean, I didn't want to make a joke about putting like Kurt Cobain in front of a romper room Captain Kangaroo situation. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's funny. You know, but Dave Grohl is actually doing it. He's now the Shanana of Duop Fifties. He's the commercialization of grunge and punk to the masses. You get oh. it? And and I think and I think we're allowing it to happen, and that's all fine. But some people don't like that, and I think that's why you're going to get a snarky writer like Mike Joyce from The Smiths, who's going to say like, "Hey, are these comedians? Are they real bluesy?" Because once you read this review. Mike Joyce from the Smiths is talking. This is real music, you know. And now, okay, so look at. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I love to call them what you will, right? Call yeah, them yeah, what yeah. You will. Um, and 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 again, let's get off of Dave Grohl. But one more thing, I like Dave Grohl. My wife's buddies with him, and uh, and I think he's solid. But he's the guy you call to bring out on stage to put a band together to sing. You know, some rock. He's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame guy. He's the one you go to for the, the last generation's oldies. So I think that's why the Blues Brothers get a little ruffled because this is an all-star band of those legends of the day. And all, that's all Belushi's trying to do is give people credit 
And at the end of the day, it's all Dave Grohl's trying to do. Give people credit. You, you know, he's got a lot of fun stuff coming out. He, he don't stop, man. But uh, call them what you will. The Blues Brothers put on a wild and exhilarating show at Meriwether Post Pavilion last night. Um, another shout out to Meriwether Post Pavilion. Um, we were talking offline about Jackson Brown, how I didn't understand him until I got older. Jackson Brown's famous live performance on Running on Empty. Live at Meriwether Post Pavilion. Oh. That's the one you hear on the radio. Oh, you sound thrilled about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're not a big Jackson Brown fan, eh? Oh, other than I, I like the song from um, um, these, Fast uh, Times at Richmond High that, uh, that you know, Yola Tango covers. Oh, that's yeah. killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a killer song. Yeah. But anyway, shout out to Meriwether Post Pavilion. I'll give you one more shout out, David Henningman, and Meriwether Post Pavilion. That place uh, stayed in my heart. I not only go there in the 80s with my father, I continue going there for years on end. And then in the late 80s, when I'm in high school age, me and the boys would go up there all the time. And guess what? Guess what was in the fence right in the back there? A hole. Oh, wow. And we could climb through the fence in the hole, the hole in the fence, and go to free shows all summer long. It was wow, great. that's awesome. I'm sure you know we either climbed it, we did it different ways, you know, because I think one time we went expecting to see the hole, and then they covered it, and we had to plan B it. Really? Um, but uh, we went, we went there often. Saw the Kinks there, saw Bowie there, Jethro Tull, just saw a, a whole bunch of you snuck um, into all Dylan, it, REM. Wow. I well, it's it. I mean, I I forget which ones we paid for and which ones we snuck into. Yeah, but oftentimes, I think more times than not. And shout out to John Zuluaga. I'm wearing a T-shirt that he gave me, and I, I would often sneak in with him. God rest in rest in the peace. The fox. So, <laughs> the fox. So check out this. And I I don't I vaguely I know there there was we had decent seats but not great seats. Um, and I know there was stuff on the stage, but I didn't realize this. Do you see that red? <laughs> so before a mock-up of a gas station complete with pumps and a payphone. <laughs> ah. that's, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, stage. Yeah. Stage stick. Yeah. Blues Brothers staged an R&B party for a solid two hours. Awesome. Huh. Awesome set. And then Mike Joyce from the Smiths finishes with... The finest work, working uh, rhythm band in blues today. Steve Cropper, mm. Matt Murphy, Duck Dunn. Blasting Stacks inspired horn section led by Tom Scott from the LA Express. <laughs> Is the finest working in rhythm and blues today. Man, 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 man. So. I mean, it sounds like a great night. I mean, especially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, uh, and I mean. And, and the Blues Brothers just keep following me. I do got to say uh, that um, that I come upon, uh, you know, the movie is becomes a cultural phenomenon, you know, starting in the 80s. And it seems to be on TV like all the time. And I get up into high school in the in the late 80s. And um, and uh, we uh, and, and I remember I was running for student council president and the night before the election the Blues Brothers is on. And so I'm like, oh my God, everyone's going to be watching the Blues Brothers. So I make some fast, me and my buddy, make some Blues Brothers Fox-related posters. Coogan <laughs> draws an amazing Fox with a Blues Brothers outfit on. Amazing. He's over at the house, I guess. And so he, he you know, it's a Fox dancing with a hat and sunglasses. And it's like, vote for Fox, vice president. And of course, what's my tagline? He's on a mission from God. Oh, nice. And I'm going, to a, I'm going to a Catholic school, so I'm allowed to say God all day. You know, it's great. And so we get up there, and then and, and, and I, and I know that so that's my shtick. And then another guy, and I, I think another guy and I, we come up with this idea together. We're even on the ticket. And I think we wear the glasses in the speech. I have a vague memory of going, of, of like wearing a mission from God and doing it again. Like it became a shtick and then, a, and I it killed and I won the election. Nice. And I got to say that it could have been on the juice of Coogan's poster uh, in this movie. And then me doing that, that was great. 
That was great. And, it, and, and yeah, I think that's how it went. And unfortunately, though, my political career there in high school was also tragic, like Belushi's career. Um, you you want to know why? <laughs> right. So we're talking about your senior senior year of high school. You were class president. Junior. junior. This is junior year. Yeah. Okay. I was I was vice I was vice vice president. Um, I was vice president my senior year. Tony was president. I was vice president. Yeah. <laughs> I think I remember that. Yeah. yeah. I was, uh, there was a scandal. Okay, I could be wrong. It could have been my senior year, but uh, there was a scandalous uh, retreat. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a ski trip, scandalous ski trip, um, in which involved some um, scandalous behavior. And I was, I among many, were dragnetted. I mean, 100% dragnetted, man. And I was impeached uh, from, from wow. that office. Uh, wow. I, had, I resigned over the loudspeaker. It was. <laughs> You, you resigned over so the I went PA. down Belushi. Yeah, I resigned over the PA. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I would like to inform you that I'm a 50 <laughs> My mission from God was canceled. I, my God told me, I mean, the principal told me to get on here and do this. <laughs> wow. So who became yeah. president? The kid that like snitched on I you? was the, yeah, no, I was the vice president. So right. I don't think no one replaces the vice president. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no one assassinates the vice president, so there's no plan to replace him. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know who took over, but uh, but mm. them's the blues, aren't they? Them's the blues, and so uh, <laughs> so we're gonna finish off here with with one last song, okay? And uh, yeah, and and again, it, it it highlights how great this band is. Um, we talked about how this band celebrates Canadian blues, uh, a lot of Chicago blues. A lot of southern blues, uh, and um, uh, and then the guys are also all from New York City. Most of them, this band forms in New York City, so you, they're all over the place. But of course, this last one, you know, this is a Texas bluesman, another modern guy uh, um, that we're gonna hear them do. I think it's Delbert. Uh, was it was it Delbert McClinton that does this last one um, that we're gonna hear? Um, yeah, Delbert McClinton, B movie car. B movie boxcar blues and it features the band. You hear McIntyre Murphy and Steve Cropper playing with each other so nicely. So this is a great soon tune to go out on. So I can't wait for y'all to to hear it. So um, um, we can uh, we can start playing that right now, shall we? All right, all right. Thanks, thanks for watching. If you made it this far, it's been episode twenty nine. Blown speakers. And, That's right. Okay. All right, Foxy, take us out. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think I need to just do this one more time. There we go. Oh, okay. Give Bang. Okay. Cool. Here we go. Now I'll take you out. Um, now I'll take you out. Oh, this is what I need to do. Bang. There we go. <laughs> Thank you.
Church shop for two pick and water. I got a ride from a fruit picker starter. Drove through the night, let the fruit just rot. She said, all I could eat for a quarter. Next I hopped the train with a hobo woman. Said she was from Texas too. Well, she did what she did, what she did, what she did to me. Made me think of you. Yeah, honey, made me think of you. I'm doing my best to get back to you. Ain't nothing I'd rather do. Look for me Sunday, gonna be there, honey, with something special just for you. Special, yeah, glory. Yeah, honey, something special just for you.